All right. So uh, the the interesting thing about this is this is like this is pretty much the beef of I think where people want to go in their entry level. They either want to make websites or they want to get data off of websites, and that's because most of the data you work with is going to be on the web, right? So it's not really as much of a thing anymore whether or not you can parse a spreadsheet, though that certainly was a thing at certain points of time. Uh, same thing with parsing PDFs and that kind of thing. You don't really need that anymore because PDFs are pretty much dead. Uh, you don't find Flash either. That's also kind of gone. So pretty much everything for your convenience is HTML5, and knowing how to manipulate it and get it is a huge part of what you'll be doing. It's how you will communicate to the world. And it is really easy to do this. I mean, remarkably easier than figuring out how to do it before. You can automate, if you figure out how to crawl a website, you can very easily automate things like a web app. Give you a case in point. You guys see this thing up in the top right? This little thing right here? That is a Chrome extension I made to automate some of cPanel stuff because cPanel uses web apps everywhere. So when the whole world is web apps, all you have to do is learn how to create them and tear them down and, and automate them. And you don't ever have to worry about like GUI stuff, you know, moving mice and the GUI and all of that other nonsense. It's all just the same sort of system. Okay, so uh, what we do here is we give a quick introduction of the web. I'm not gonna browbeat you with that information. I think it's pretty boring. But what we do is we have the web breaks down into different components, and these are definitely important. It's really important that we have an understanding of that. What, how that, that, those components work is think of it like this. You have uh, one job of, of being a computer programmer is actually getting data, right? The transfer of the data, the network interchange of that data, that type of act, right? And there's different ways you can break up that task too. But for the purposes of the web and what we're doing, we don't ever have to break it up any more than that. Just think of it as one part of that task is getting the data. And what we use for that is requests in Python. And that's a, a module that says, I want to go to this web server and I want to pull down this HTML file, right? Now you have a file, it's HTML. And it's like any other file. It's like an executable file. It's like a music file. The only difference is inside of that file, there is a specific format of data called HTML. So the next part of your task is going to be to actually parse that HTML, to pull out what you want from that file, right? So the interesting thing here is we use this thing called beautiful soup, which is horribly misnamed because it's not beautiful and it has nothing to do with soup. But what that essentially is, is jQuery for Python. So how many people in here have heard of jQuery or use jQuery? Very cool. So jQuery, everyone, it's great. jQuery is essentially now you don't really need jQuery like you used to need it, you know. So the, the, this is really uh, in, a, in a slightly different tangent. If you're going to go and you're going to do a lot of web development, it's almost worth learning how the browser works with the DOM, right? So do you understand soup arguments? I have no. You tell me. Okay, so HTML, like before they tried to refine it, like XH, XHTML, they called it tag soup. And so most of the processors before were called like soup processors. Interesting. I'd never heard of a soup processor. I've heard of tree parsing. I've heard of sax parsing. I've heard of Libix. You know, there's thousands of different ways to do it. But there we go. So it dates back to antiquity when people <laughs> called HTML soup. Are you looking for the uh, the Python class? You're doing awesome. Don't worry about it. Everyone walks in in the front, and plenty of people will walk in in the next half hour, hour. It'll all be good. OK, so what we're going over now is we're, we're quickly covering the different layers of, of actually addressing web data, right, and how we go about doing it. So what I've just said is that when we break apart this task, we always break apart web tasks into two different components. One of them is getting the data. And for that, in Python, we're going to use this module called requests. And then the other method is actually parsing that data. And then for that, in Python, we're going to use this thing called beautiful soup. Beautiful soup gives you the ability to select inside of that HTML document the different things you want. So it has its own special syntax. You guys remember when we covered regexes? We said regexes are kind of weird because they're not really like Python. And they look funny. And you got to give them the stank eye. And then you kind of realize that it's just a different language, right? A regex is a really convenient language to parse text. Well, there's CSS selectors 
that work in much the same way, and we use them to parse HTML, right? So you give your CSS selector to this library called Beautiful Soup, and it knows what to do with it, and everything it does is not easy, right? Beautiful Soup is a very complex library, but any idiot can use it, and that's great, because we're all somewhere between the people who create Beautiful Soup and the bottom of the barrel, because that's a big job. So, and, and I say that myself included, parsing HTML is literally a bear's task. We used to tell people when they get into programming, we would always say to them, if you're parsing HTML, you're doing it wrong, right? And the reason is simple, there's 10,000 corner cases in it. So you just give it to Beautiful Soup and it takes care of it. Okay, now there's another thing in here called Selenium, and Selenium launches and controls a web browser. Selenium is a whole other level of complexity, and I don't know if we get to that in this chapter. I think we may at the bottom, I read this a while ago. But Selenium gives you the ability to control the, mo the mouse, right? So here's the thing. In most cases for parsing websites, it's not required, and that's awesome. But you can actually take full control over the browser experience and move the mouse and do all of that type of thing and screen capture the page as it's rendered. And Selenium allows you to do all of that. So thankfully, not usually required, usually a lot more work, but we can do it. So what we're seeing here is that right off the bat, we introduced this module called Web Browser, and Web Browser is very simple. All it does is it opens a web browser, right? So if we open up a tab, and we go into our Python 3, up, oh, thanks Mac, import uh, Web Browser, I'm not sure if I have that on this install, I do, and then I can say Web Browser dot open, and I can say, give me a sample website, cPanel, why not? They buy us Cokes and pizza. And then it opens it up right there, right? It takes us right to cPanel. So this is a module that essentially takes care of the act of starting open a web browser or opening up a tab. And that's really kind of cool because let's say you have Firefox and Chrome on your computer. This one hopefully pulls out the right one, right? It takes care of that kind of gory work. You know, what is your default browser? And what we do here is we get a tab and that tab starts up with whatever we give it. So I gave it cPanel, and then there we are at the cPanel site. Okay, so uh, let's go back here, and boop, nope. There we go. Okay, and uh, scrolling down, we're gonna see here that we have some tasks that we're gonna be doing, and getting right off the bat, this is where it's really cool. Now we're doing something that's practical. So a lot of the things we've done before, we really had to stretch to find something that was stupid enough that we could figure out. But now, as we progress further and further through the book, the examples become less and less stupid and more and more useful. So what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, we want to get an address from the command line argument or the clipboard, right? This author really likes the clipboard. I can't quite figure it out, but I'll, you'll see a lot of his demonstrations use the clipboard and it's really useful, so I guess why not? But we're going to get a, uh, an address from the command line argument, meaning when we invoke that thing, that Python script, we provide it right there, or we just have it copied, right? You Apple key copy or whatever they do on this horrible and interesting aluminum can. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up a Google Maps page and we're going to search for that address, right? So you'll see here, we're gonna read from the command line arguments from sys.argv. Now, We've already covered sys.argv, so everyone remembers in this class, because I think I taught that, what the first argument in sys.argv is, right? What's the first argument? The program. the program name, right? So don't let it fool you. If you're expecting to take something from sys.argv, you better have more than one thing there. Otherwise, you just have your name of your program. And then what we're going to do is we're going to read the clipboard contents, right? So we don't actually have to read the clipboard contents. If we have an argument, we can skip that step. But if we don't have an argument, that's what we're going to do. And then we're going to call webbrowser.open, which is going to do just what we saw, pop open the web browser. Now, before we go, let's always play around. And I don't know the answer to a lot of these questions. I just ask them publicly, and I try to look intelligent as I research them. So I don't know what web browser does, but it's a pretty vague name, right? I could think of a lot of shit that web browser would do, and webbrowser.open is just one thing. How would I find out what web browser does? Check the docs. Peter, what'd you say? Help. That's right. That's the right answer. Help, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back down here to my web browser, my Python console. That's right. And I'm going to say help web browser, right? And then it's going to tell me what it does. And that's how we check the docs. Now, in this case, those docs are 
big fonted, but we can scroll down and I can actually see here. Let's read the, the top part of what it does. I just gave you the spoiler. Interfaces for launching and remotely controlling web browsers. So that's all this does, right? And if I scroll down to the very bottom, you see this little section called functions, and this tells you some other things it does. Returns a browser launcher instance appropriate for the environment. Okay, I'm kind of confused at how that's different from open, but that's what it says. And then we have open, which takes a URL. Oh, I think get, yeah, let's leave that alone. Open just takes a URL, then we have open new and open new tab. So we have different ways we can open an actual URL, right? We can open it in a whole new browser window or just in a new tab. So that's the full amount of functionality that a web browser has. And again, it's just cool to actually navigate this stuff ourselves. The book isn't gonna go over that. So now we know how we can answer those questions. Now, figuring out the URL. So here's what we're doing. We're passing it this string. Now here's the kicker, the way this is being invoked, and I'm not sure that this is the way the author intended it, but it could be. This is how many arguments? Mm. People are counting, so you're all right. It doesn't matter if it's six or seven. The point is it's not one, right? Okay, so to actually pass something as one argument to the shell, you actually have to quote that, right? And this is not quoted. So that means that all of those different things we're getting here, 870 Valencia Street, San Francisco, California, 94110, all of these come in as different arguments. Okay, second question. 870 and 94110, are these strings or are these integers? They're strings. They're strings. strings, they're strings, right? Everything you get from the command line is a string. So if you type it on your keyboard in the command line, it gets passed in as a string. Now we can make them integers, and how do we do that? Recapping. How? How do we type? How do we cast? Int. Int. There we go. Beautiful, right? So if we take that string and we wrap it in int, we get what we're looking for. All right. So uh, here we go. Where do the commas land? Where do the commas land? Those are seven different variables. Like, is that comma on street? Does it stay with street? That's right. It would stay okay. with street. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. The white space is how the shell will break apart those different arguments. Okay. So first you need to find out what URL to use for the given street address. So how do we do that? This is actually kind of cool, and this is part of that process. When you get into the mode of doing websites, you are kind of reverse engineering how they work, right? The difference here is in Selenium, you don't reverse engineer how they work. It's a different mindset. In Selenium, you act like a user. But when you do this as a computer programmer and you're not using Selenium, you have to think, how is that website working? That's got to become a conscious project, uh, uh, a conscious thing, right? So I can give you different examples where, I, where how you do it in industry. But if I come up here and I go uh, maps.google.com, right? And I say, okay, this is what I'm seeing. This is how I do it. And if I go up here and I search for something, like let's say... Uh, I don't know, uh, let's pick my, one of my favorite bars, Avant Garden, right? Right down here, Avant Garden, and I give it a name, and I hit enter. We can see here, the search says right here, Avant Garden, right? So we have to think to ourselves, what if I put something else there that's not Avant Garden, right? What if I delete this right here, and I just get rid of all that crap, and I just say something like cPanel? What is it going to do now, right? What will it do? We don't know. We hit enter. Okay, and conveniently it finds us with cPanel. So that's the thought process that you have to use when you're navigating a different website, right? You want to say to yourself, this URL is the key. This is going to get me where I want to go. How can I manipulate that URL? Now, URLs are what? When we manipulate them, they act as what? Strings. Strings, right? So they're, function they're subject to all of those same string features we found earlier, which are in prior chapters. We see a bunch of these little forward slash things forward slash yes for the backslash is under the backspace someone corrected me on that one <laughs> so those are forward slashes so we see these forward slash things here right and we have already determined that we can break them apart based on that and that's quite frequently useful how do we do that split, split. okay so that splits it apart and then we're going to have maps place and we have a search term at the end or we could put something there how do we get them back together join it's that simple right now we talked about this earlier we have a url.join and we have a string.join right so we're going to use the url.join and it throws all that crap in there for you and it makes it all make sense okay so we can see that that's going to be part of the task as we go forward but it's important to definitely understand how we address it otherwise when you have to do something that's not the book is telling you 
you won't figure it out. Okay, so the address in the URL, the address is in the URL, but there's a lot of additional text in there as well. We have already determined we can cut out that text, right? So what they're saying is if we look at the original, we see all of this stuff at the back, but that is not needed, superfluous, garbage. We can cut it off and it'll all work. And if you've ever seen Facebook, by the way, you use a Facebook link, you ever try copying one of those things? You see how much shit they have in there? It's literally like uh, you got a page down to see all that URL. All of that stuff is to track you, right? So now you know why it's all there. So when you paste that link to your friend and your friend clicks on that link or paste it to his friend, what it tells them is, hey, Bob sent this to Mary, Mary sent this to me, and now I'm clicking it. So therefore, there's a social graph Facebook can create, and it knows if Bob sends me something, I'm more likely to click it, or if Mary sends, that's what all that stuff is there doing. But when you actually want to copy a Facebook link, all that you really need is, you know, up until the ID. You see event ID, everything else is crap. Spyware. Okay. Next, we have to handle some command line arguments. So here we have this. We say import web browser and sys, right? And we've already established web browser is going to open stuff up, and sys is going to give us access to this argv argument. And we already know the first one in there is the name of the program. So we're just seeing if it's more than one. That just means if we gave it anything whatsoever, right? If you give me any arguments whatsoever, then I want to get to the address from the command line. And we already talked about it. How do we do that? We join all of the rest of those arguments together. So we're joining them all on a space. The reason why? The computer, the shell that you use is going to break up all of them on the space. It's going to give them to your program. And your program is going to say, I want that space back in there. I want one argument with the space. So that's how it does it. It's going to join all of those different discrete arguments back with spaces. And uh, you'll notice here, the original task was to use either command line arguments or, or the clipboard. So here's the fallback to the clipboard. They haven't done that, right? So if we have more than one argument, use the arguments. If we have less than one argument, else at the bottom, we're going to put in that, that pipe for a clip, I think was the name of it. OK. So you can see here we have different mechanisms. Oh, uh, let's go back up here. We have this syntax right here, right? We called this something before. Does anyone know the name of that? Uh, it is a range, but there's a specific name for it in computer programming. And I think we went over the name. Slice. Slice. Boom. Right? So a slice takes a subset of an array, a contiguous subset. So you can say you want to slice something from 5 till the end, from the beginning till the second element. All of that is a slice. You're taking out part of that array. You're slicing it. OK. So you can see here, here we go again. This is the example. This is what it's getting. You can see the first argument is the name of the program. All of these subsequent arguments are what the shell is giving it. The shell, by the way, is this thing, right? When we type into something, well, that's two of them. We only need one of them, but this on the right is the shell. This is Python. That's probably a good learning opportunity there, right? This guy on the right is what I have whenever I start one of them up. It, ex it expects a certain amount of commands, right? Let me go into downloads, right? I just use CD to get into downloads. I can do CD to get into automate the boring stuff with Python. CD is a shell command. I can say ls, and I can see all of the things inside of there. All of those are shell commands. That is the shell. On the left-hand side, this is Python. This only expects Python. This does not accept shell commands. If I type in ls, I get a syntax error, right? So it's not all things with a black background and white text or a black background and green text. Specifically, the shell is accepting those CD ls commands that you boot into. It's how you launch Python. Your PowerShell is a shell. CMD is a shell. Bash is a shell. Some of the other names out there. OK. And we can always exit with exit. Chops us out. OK. So the shell is going to break apart all of these on spaces, send them all to our program. And then we are going to reconstitute that, that, that string argument back with spaces. So step three, handle the clipboard content and launch the browser, right? Here we go. We import web browser, sys, and piper clip, right? So web browser opens it. Sys gives us access to ARGV. 
And Piperclip allows us to manipulate that clipboard. So when we copy shit, our computer can get access to it without us having to retype it in somewhere. And then we say, if the length, if again, if we have, the, if we have an argument, what we're going to do is get the address like that. Otherwise, we're going to get the address from Piperclip. And then we're going to open up that web browser address. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting here is they're concatenating onto this. And we had a whole entire chapter in the book that was telling us not to do that. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. OK. We went over how we can do URLs in the book, right? right let's see here. Do, 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 automate the boring stuff. And then we have down here. Yeah, I think it was in the manipulating string chapter, wasn't it? URLs, URI. It was after that, I think. Where did we go over that? Maybe it was organizing files. <coughs> yep. Nope. Does anyone remember going over it? I know we did this. I just don't remember where we did it. My fine folks is not seeing it before chapter 11. Okay, well then I guess we'll find it later. But I know we went over using, I think, the URL module here. And we did the difference between, I think, no, maybe we did path names on the. C it's because we have Windows and they install path names. So That's what we did. Okay, okay, cool. So that makes sense. Okay. So then the, we haven't introduced this yet as a concept. Okay. Which is good because me knowing that means that I shouldn't go over that publicly. Okay. So we have web browser to open and we give it essentially the URL. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to say we're getting a map with and without mapit.py. And we show you the breakdown here. If we manually get a map, what we're going to do is we highlight the address, we copy the address, and we open the web browser. Go to maps.google.com. That's how we would manually do it. Click on the address link text field, paste the address up at the top, and press enter. Right To follow that flow chart, that's exactly what we just did on maps.google.com when I copied and I pasted cPanel. Right? Uh, and when they say uh, highlight the address, they're talking about the name or the place that you're looking at. Right? Just whatever you put in that top piece. Using mapit.py, look how many of these steps we've cut out. Right? Now all we have to do with mapit.py is we highlight the address, we hit the copy button and we run mapit.py and we save all the rest of those steps. So you can see all of these steps here that we've now trimmed out of our workflow and that's the crux of this book. That's how we automate the boring stuff, right? We no longer have to do all this other crap. Okay. So now they're going to give you some ideas for similar programs. As long as you have the URL, the web browser module lets users cut out the step of opening the browser and directing themselves to a website. So, the, so we're just opening it up with that. But now what we'll notice is we have never actually gotten a web page. So we've neither gotten the web page nor have we parsed it, right? So this name of this book, this chapter here, is, is scraping things from the web. But so far we have done nothing that has anything to do with scraping, just to be very clear about it. We've learned the process of how we can go find a URL and how we can dissect that URL and try to figure out what's happening, right? And we've also learned how to open up a web browser but none of that is getting us data from a website, right? And that's where the scraping kicks in. So now what we're going to do is we're going to see how we scrape. So we can see here that there's a module called request that we're going to be using, and we need to install that module. So if you run this command, it should work. But I always suggest people install with a slightly different command, the dash dash user one. And I think I have already done it. Let's see here. Nope, is it request or, yep, okay. So watch. I'm gonna say here uh, pip install dash dash user request. Uh -oh. User bin python. Okay. That is weird. 
Oh, OSX, why do we do this? I I I think it did. I thought we used it last week. Python pip? Python pip? It doesn't. There's no pip. It's not on the system. Uh, let's try. One more time here. Is there a brew install pip or something I need to do? Python. Python. No module name pip. No module name uh, pip three. Python three. Is it, is it you Python say Python, Python is going to go Python three. Python three dash m pip. I think all OS chips Python are alias to Python. No, so Python. Oh. So Python three space dash m pip. I don't think, I think that this is core OS X, and I think OS X is shipping the dead Python. Is that what's happening? There we go. Brew install Python 3. Okay, let's see how that works. Will, will, will it work, Robert? This is how you install stuff with... Okay, let's try sudo brew install. Someone get me a Linux box. <laughs> it's giving you the fix right there at the bottom. What is it? Okay, so this is... I can sudo this. So chmod, there we go. Is that what it's complaining about? That's what brew showed up. I don't know. Is it going to compile Python? Seriously? It's not. It's a bottle. I just read it. It's Okay. So pip3. Ha ha. Okay. Pip3 install dash dash u. Well, we'll just skip that. Uh, what is it? It's called a request. Boom. Okay. Collecting requests, and then it's going to go ahead and install it. And now, if all of this works, what we should be able to do is go uh, Python 3. And then I should be able to go import requests. R-E-Q-U-E-S-T-S. -E -E and now help requests. And it's, it's working. Okay, good. There we go. Thank you. Thank I used an OSX machine. I, I, take, I take pride in that. Yep. Okay. I, but, but I think, did it eat my window? No, there it is. Okay. So this is what we got. We pip install request, and now we have this request module. Now what we can use is we can use this module uh, to... Now what it's telling you here is that there's another module called URL lib2, right? It's telling you you don't have to use that. Request is what they call an abstraction on top of it, right? So request gives us the ability to download an HTML page or a website, right, remotely. And then it lets us do whatever we want to with it. So you're going to see here, we, we import requests after we install it. And now we have this function called request.get, right? So if you look right here, you're going to see that we import requests. And then we have something called res, right? Res is very, very common when you're computer programming. Res is always the response object. So you'll see those three letters a lot. REQ, by the way, is a request object, right? So in some languages you have, you can build a request object. In requests, you can also do that. But you're gonna notice right here, we actually create the request with just the URL. We're not building the object with it. 
So res is an object that is the response returned by request.get. So we call request.get and we get ourselves back a response object. And when we say type, right, we're going to get the actual type for it. And you can see it right down there, request.models.response, right? Now this is also really convenient because you should be able to use this with help, right? So that's another really good method of determining whether or not you can find documentation on whatever you're looking at. That usually works. Let's see if it works for us this time. Now I've already imported it and if I go help here and then I paste it, of course that's not going to work. What I'm doing is I'm using control and then I'm using the aluminum can. So we're going to go help and then apple v and now you can see that I have the response object up here. So this is going to tell us how we can do whatever we want to do when we get back that thing, right? So we tell request, go out to the server and get me a website. And request is giving you a response object. And now here's all of the things you can do with it, right? So we can go down here and there should be a spot somewhere right at the bottom that does write down methods. Right here is where they start. So we can find out the encoding of the method. We can get the content size, the content of the response in bytes, right? So we can get whether or not it's a permanent redirect. Some websites will redirect you and there's a specific thing that they can do for that. This will tell you if you have, uh, uh, whoa, that's not good. There are buttons on the back of the TV screen. <laughs> well, it got both of them now. You found that's out what it. that button does. Power button. I did, I found the power button. Let's, let's let that I click on. It's one of those touch sensitive so ones. Like, that one too, did that yeah. one get off too? Yeah, yeah. well there are links to where if you turn one off the other will turn off, but they're not links to where if you turn one on the other will turn off. I, I actually, I actually even <laughs> thought, I, I thought that we were looking for buttons before and we didn't find the buttons. We couldn't find the remote. Today we find the remote and I accidentally find the buttons. That's life for you. Okay. <laughs> So uh, making lemonade here out of lemons, what we have is we have the permanent redirect, we have the is redirect. These are two predicates, we already went over that. They're gonna return a Boolean, whether or not they're true or false, right? Whether we're getting redirected. Uh, you're gonna see some other stuff down here. All of this will be useful, right? But none of this is a method to actually get what we want out of that document. You'll see here we have text, which is kind of cool. This is really useful. Let's say that you make a web request, right? to a file and that file has no HTML in it. It's literally like something someone wrote in Notepad, right? If you're just writing shit in Notepad and you're saving it to the web and it doesn't have HTML, you could use text and you could find out what's inside of it. Okay. So coming back down, what we do here is we found out now we can use this type to figure out what we have and what it gives us something as a class, we can actually look up that documentation and the help on it. So we can always figure out more about it. And one of those things we saw was status code. So we can check that. And we can even check to make sure that what we get, we make this request, we're getting something back successfully, right? So you notice here, the response has a status code. And then the request module has inside of it a class called codes, which has its own thing called okay. So what we're doing here is we're making sure that the status code that we get back matches this other thing in request, that it, the response is okay, right? So we print down here the length of response.txt. This tells us the length of that whole entire response in characters. So if we upload, for instance, Harry Potter is a text file on a website, we can use request to pull it down. And then after we have it down, we can say response.txt to get that content and we can pass it to length, just like any other string. And that's what they're trying to show you here, that length takes a string and response.txt is a string, right? Okay, now here we have another slice. We talked about this before. All strings in Python can be treated like an array of characters. Remember, we had that? So here we have colon 250, what does that mean? First 250 bytes. Characters, that's exactly right. First 250 characters. And you can see here in this example of it, we get the Project Gutenberg ebook of Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare, all yada, 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 yada. So you can see here, the author has this thing that he's got. Let's see if this really exists so we can play with it. And it does. 
right? So the author has uploaded Romeo and Juliet onto his personal website. And here's the kicker. This Romeo and Juliet book has no HTML in it. So the author is prying out of this the complexity of the HTML parsing because we haven't gotten there yet. And he's trying to show you just how to use this request module. So we use requests to get Romeo and Juliet. And then we say after we've got it, after we make sure it's okay, we have this, this, this whole thing in one string in Python, what we want to do is print out the first 250 characters. And that's what we're doing right here, right, with this. Okay, uh, I'm not fighting with pizza. I think we'll break and we'll come back here in a little bit and resume. All right, so what we did here is we have just downloaded Romeo and Juliet, right? And what we did when we downloaded Romeo and Juliet is we saw that we could treat the response as a string and we can chop it up like we could any other string. We can perform all those great little operations with regexes. We can pull out all this kind of text right here. Uh, but now we're going to start to do more, more sophisticated things. Uh, before we do that, we're going to make a pit stop and we're going to check for errors. So we already checked for errors in one way, right? If you remember, we used that response.status code okay thing, right? We, we checked it against request.codes that okay. So essentially request.codes is a whole list of all of your status codes for, uh, for HTML. And for those of you that, I think that it says it here explicitly, uh, 404, right? <laughs> Everyone's seen this one before, 404, file not found. Uh, that is also a status code. So the real ones that you should know if you're gonna do this all the time would be uh, the 404 and 200. I wanna, there we go, okay. So what we can do here is we can go help, and it was uh, requests.codes. And you can see here the list of them. If we type it in, requests.codes, I bet we actually get them all. Oh, no. There we go. So you give it whatever you're looking for, and it tells you the status code for it. We may, yeah, let's leave it at that. So when we did request.code, is that okay? We actually got 200, and that's, a, that's all that it's telling you right there, is that if you don't want to remember that okay is 200 and actually write the 200 number out, you can use this to figure them all out. And this is that request.code thing up there. Okay. So uh, you'll notice that they have this thing here, raise for status, right? This is kind of cool. All this does is it checks the response object, right, which has a code. And that code tells you essentially what the server said about whatever it's giving you. I found the file and I've got it. That file has been redirected. The file is not found. The server is going to tell you all of these things by giving you a standardized HTTP code. <coughs> There's a specific thing Python has called raise for status, right? And when you call this, it translates those HTTP codes, which you may or may not know, into what you will experience with Python everywhere else, right? When you do something in Python and it doesn't make sense, what does Python do? Throws an error, right? Throws an error. It says syntax error. It says you can't do that. What you're doing is stupid. I don't know, right? The problem is web servers don't do errors like that, right? A web server could say, like when you ask for a website, you say, get me this website. The web server gives you back an HTML page, right? But when you ask for a site that's not there, what does it give you back? More often than not, also an HTML page. That's what I'm looking for. It's not just a 404 error, right? If I go to Google, right, and I type in something that doesn't exist like that, right, you see this is a web page, just like any other, right? So if you're relying on requests, you're saying requests, go get me this page, and request gives you back another website, you have to have a method of saying that website is wrong, right? That that's not a real, that's not the website you're looking for. That's an error page, right? Because an error page is also a website usually. So this is the status code, the 404 thing. And you can check that with response.status code, right? You can compare it against the request.codes.ok, right? Or what you can do in addition to that is you can call this little method here, raise for status. And what does that do? It says, is this error okay? If not, I'm going to throw an error, right? That means you don't have to go looking at that web page that it threw back to you, the error page, right? So you get a 404 client error, 
Now it's going to actually raise an exception. And we covered that, Ed covered that in the last class. We covered exceptions and assertions and that kind of stuff. Okay, so we can say here, we're saying import request. We're saying request.get. And notice here, this time, there's no Romeo and Juliet. Page that does not exist, right? So what we do is we wrap that in a try block. And a try block means if it fails, trigger the accept block, right? So we say re response.raise for status. Now this is going to go out and it's going to say, what code is this response object, right? The response object is going to say, I'm not 200. And because I'm not a 200, I'm going to throw an error. Boom. Hits it out of the park. Now the try block catches that error, and it's going to trigger the accept block down here. Right? So the exception object gets passed as exc. It says there was an error, and it's going to pass that exception right there. And that's how that whole thing works. Right? Otherwise, you've got to test for status codes yourself, and you have to do something that doesn't look at all like Python. Because if we were to do this the other way, right, and we were to say something like if rest.code equals status.ok or whatever. That You can program like that. It's totally fine. But it's not going to look like anything else will do in Python. right? And everything else in Python, an error raises an exception. In HTML, HTTP, you're going to get a status code that's not 200, 400 status code or something that's like that. OK. Question? I don't get the point of caching it right there. If you just if you just run it, it will also throw an exception. So. Because they want the exception, rather than it to bubble up to the user to say there was a problem, and then the exception, rather than just simply the exception. So only in this method can you get there was a problem. Okay. Right? Just changing the error message, basically. That's it. Yep. And not just as it's changing the error message, if it bubbles up to the user, right, then it's going to stop the whole program's execution. This is going to catch it. It's going to say there was a problem. It's going to print out the error message, and then it's going to keep executing. So if you have crap below it, right, just to rephrase what this question is, the question is, what does this do? If we didn't have it, what would happen? If we didn't have this, you would get the error message. You would not see there was a problem. You would just see the error message, and that execution would stop, right? And it stops because anytime you don't catch the error, and it bubbles up to the user and it dumps it on their page, vomits all over the place. Anytime that happens, the, at the highest level, the program goes, this was supposed to have been handled, and it wasn't handled. You didn't clean up your shit. So it dies. It, it, that's it. Python's done running. Sometimes that's OK. In this case, you may want to put stuff under it. Who knows? Uh, yeah, so uh, always call raise with error after setting request.get. It's a strong word, but whatever. Uh, import request, request.get, and then we call it again, raise for status. Now we know here that if this is going to throw an error to the user, then this line here is 200, right? So re raise for status says if, the, the, if we're not okay, if there's any problems, if the server had a problem, the server's down, if it returns to us 404, it can't find the file, if we have the wrong password, if it's forbidden, all of those are different things HTTP can do. If we get to here, though, we know we're OK. So what we're doing is we say, if we successfully retrieve this file, open this locally. Create this file locally, right? And we're putting it in write mode with bytes. And then we're simply writing to that file. So this is how we can download a website. You guys remember yesterday we had Mark displaying a parallel downloading program because he wanted to pull down uh, what was Plus. So Google, Plus. Google Plus, which is a repository of all of humanity's knowledge of the best sort <laughs> for aspiring and confused preteens. It's definitely something worth backing up. But we went through and we were backing it up, right? This is not a good way to write something that's that big. But this is a way to get the job done, right? So if you ever have to download some of your company's shit, specifically like one file or a couple of files or something like that, you can do it like this easily now. You're done, right? And if you ever want to download all of the preteen stuff, Mark's got you covered. See him after class. OK. Playfile.close, right? This says here that you're done with Playfile. Right, you've, you've finished writing to it, and now you're going to close it and finish that file, right? Okay. You'll notice here this iter content method. 
right? Iter means iterator, right? Which is essentially a fancy way of saying it's not going to do everything at once, right? So what that means is, let's say you have a file online, right? Like, let's say Mark's project is successful and he has the whole entire world's collection of preteen ramblings on Google+. And he takes all of that shit and he puts it all in one compressed file and throws it up on his website, right? Stupidmustingsof8yearolds.com. Now you want to go download that, right? He said that that thing is petabytes big. You can't sit there and download petabytes from one file, right, and expect that to work. Because the first thing that happens is, as you start to download that file, it's going to take all of that stuff off the wire and put it in RAM, in your computer's memory. And when you've exhausted that 8 gigs of RAM or that 16 gigs of RAM, your computer's just going to die anyway, right? That's what happens when you just download that request normally. It stores it all in RAM, you exhaust RAM, now you have to do something else. That's the best case scenario with that, right? The other alternative is that you have halfway through downloading your 16 gigs of RAM, your 8, your eight gigs into it, you lose internet connection or something gets interrupted, right? All of these types of things can happen. What ITER content does right here is it iterates through that and as it iterates through it, you write a little piece at a time. Finishes the job, right? The iter content method returns chunks of the content of each iteration. After it returns you the chunk, you can write the chunk, you can forget about the chunk, and you can move on to the next chunk. And because you're doing it like this, like a stream that you're iterating over, you never have to store all of the shit in RAM, right? And it gives you, it gives you a couple of other benefits too, right? So we write to this play file a chunk that we get from iter content, and then we move on to the next one. And you can see here what it's, what it's actually, what we're getting out, right? Each chunk is of the bytes data type, and you get to specify how many bytes each chunk will contain. 100,000 bytes is generally a good size, so 100,000 is the argument to iter content. The file of Romeo and Juliet will now exist in the current working directory, right? So long as it's under 100,000 bytes. And then it doesn't exist in the current directory because you didn't give it a big enough argument. Uh, or wait, no, that's not true. That's how many bytes it's pulling through each time. Yes, okay. Let me be clear about that. Let me back up one second, right? We said here 100,000, right? That is the byte size of each chunk you pull down from that file. Does that make sense? So the file that we have, this Romeo and Juliet file, that is the sum of these two numbers. 100,000, 1 million, no, 100,000 plus 78,981. 178,981 bytes is how big that file is. The first time we go through it, we take 100,000 bytes. The second time we go through it, we take the 78,981 bytes, right? So ITER content is taking the maximum amount of bytes for each chunk. There we go. I just want to be precise about it because I screwed it up the first time. So uh, that's it. That's where he goes through it. So now what we can do is to review here's the steps. Call request.get. Request.get takes the URL. We download the file. We call open with WB. Now, if we remember right, open with W is horribly named. Right? It makes sense to a computer for low-level reasons, but it doesn't make sense to people. And the reason is, when we think of open, we think of getting something that already exists. It's hard to open a door if the door isn't there. Right? But the, when you tell a computer you want to open a file, if that file doesn't exist, that's just how you do it. You do it with an open function, an open system call. Right? So we call open with WB, and it means write that file. We're opening a file handle to write with. We're not necessarily opening the file because it, it's not there. We're, we're going to return a file handle. Then what we're going to do is we're going to loop over the response objects with either content. We write out each chunk and then we close the file handle. Okay. Is there any questions so far? So to recap, we did the Piper clip. We learned how to copy and paste shit again for the ninth time. We learned how to download stuff with requests and we learned how to open things with a web browser. Right, that's where we're at. Okay, now we're going to get into this whole thing about HTML. And the reason is that in order to do practical things on the web, you have to have some understanding of how the system works. 
So they have given you some basic beginner guides right here, and I have no idea about the first two, right? I have heard reasonable things about Code Academy, never seen it even. I have heard nothing about HTML dog before today, and it may be awesome. There's another one at the bottom. This one is very thorough and a horrible idea for a beginner. This is what I use, right? So I, can, I have a lot of experience with it, and I love it, and I use it all the time. You're not there yet. You, this is not a good resource for you. So uh, my suggestion is, yes? Code Academy is pretty decent, and if you want to do your hand to be held, you can fill up the range. Excellent. There, then that's, that's great. So Code Academy may be worth checking out. I will say this too. Tanya mentioned earlier, Jesse, it inspiring. Is that right? Improving. Improving. I always fuck up because it's such a stupid name for a company. It's like they just, they had, they had a whole wall of motivational posters and they, <laughs> improving, <laughs> fuck it. Okay. The guy up there though is super cool. Uh, and the space is pretty nice. It's all the way down there in the energy corridor. They run a meetup called Free Code Camp, right? And Free Code Camp is a reasonably good way of learning HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And they have a whole meet up there. It's probably maybe even bigger than that. It's probably twice the size at, at, at a busy day as this. They, they, I've seen 60 people there. I used to do it all the time. It's a pain in the ass to get there unless you're on the west side of town. But if you're on the west side of town and this interests you, definitely check it out, right? And it's the same gig, except they have crappier pizza than the one cPanel buys for you. You're going to get stuck with Papa John's. Yes? Apparently, these are ordered in levels of difficulty. HTML doc does a pretty good beginner's HTML CSS. Cool. Cool. Yeah, it's been a long time since I was a beginner, so I don't know. But I, the, if, you want a, if you want a community, and I'm guessing everyone here is because they want a community, there is a badass blossoming community over there with Free Code Camp. Uh, and there's at least five or six people that will help you out with it. And when you walk in, they give you a little tag, tells you what level you are. So you can go ahead and associate with other people that are beginner level or intermediate or advanced or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's a pretty good thing they have going on there. I definitely suggest checking it out. Nothing bad about the place or the meetup, just the weird company name. Okay. A quick refresher. It's not a refresher. No one knows what we're talking about. So here's the deal. When we look at something like this here, the strong tag, element world, you're going to learn there's different ways of getting this stuff, right? We talked about beautiful soup, right? Beautiful soup is going to give you methods in which you can access different parts of the document. When we did regexes, we actually treated the text and parsed it with the real language, right? When we look at HTML, it is a markup language. What does that mean? What's the difference between a markup language and text? Does anyone know that answer? Does the markup change like how the text is displayed, the bold, the italics? Yeah, it's not like a, a, a Hold on. meta language in a way. Wait, I don't see any hands up. <laughs> I don't see any hands up. Wait. Wait. He's going to have a fucking aneurysm if I just go for three more seconds. <laughs> any hands up? No. Okay, Ed. No, I'm kidding. He's, he's very eager to hit this well, one up. That's exactly right. So there's Robert. So usually a, a file that's markup language is a text file. But you've given it, you've endued it with some kind of extra meaning. That's like a, these braces mean that it's bold or stuff like that. Right, right. I actually, I, I like Robert's definition. Slightly. No, I'm, I'm just trying to get it's at that. No, no. They're, they're both equally good definitions. Let me hit them on, though, on both sides, of the, on, on both angles here. Right, here's the kicker. The kicker here is that this is just text, right? There's nothing special about it in the fact that it is still just characters, right? That's how the computer sees it at the lowest level, is just bytes. But the markup actually imbues specific meaning to it. It's really hard to parse sentences. Anyone here in elementary school remember sentence trees? Mm -hmm. Okay, sentence trees are a pain in the ass for me. They're Peter's forte, right? <laughs> if you have any questions about them. But the reason why they're a pain in the ass is because you don't get the sentence tree when you're making the sentence tree, right? That makes it very difficult because now you have a sentence and you have to figure out where everything goes, right? So. 
there's no real way to make a language that abuses a non-existent tree. But with HTML, there's a lot of ways you can actually make sense out of this, right? And that's that special meaning part. Strong is actually an element. And this stuff here is called the inner text, right? And if you have this ending strong, you can say, I want to go one thing to the right. And you can say, to the right, I see world. Now, to the right is either next or literally to the right, depending on the language. But there's, there's a certain method here. You can look at things in the, in the scope of a tree. Hello is inside of strong, inside of strong. Or you can say, strong, this tree here, is to the left of world. World is to the right of this tree strong. World is next, the next thing you'll get. All of those are possible. And that's where HTML breaks away from regular text, is that we get to do all of those types of things now. So here's we see here, uh, Al's free. We're, we're again, we're creating some text. Let's go up here and let's talk about the strong tag. The strong tag is just a way of adding emphasis, right? So here's what happened. A long, long time ago in HTML world land place, there was something called B. And B was a tag that literally meant bold. And then someone said, but that doesn't make much sense because if you're blind, you can't see bold or non-bold. So how do we make that make sense to someone who doesn't ever interact with vision? So we have things like strong, which no longer mean bold it. They just mean emphasize it or make it, you know, stronger. And that's how this came along. So strong and emphasis and all these, these are just different ways to do the same things we used to do. But you have to now know that strong means bold. In most browsers you can change it that's what it means and M is another one which means emphasis so if we scroll down here you're gonna see some new tags now just like that strong tag we had we have this a href right this is a very very popular HTML tag anyone know what the a stands for anchor Ooh, click on the gun you saw the question coming did you hear that I don't know if I was done with it well done anchor anchor tag right so the anchor tag is a method of saying that you want to go somewhere or you want to make it note or a tag so other people can come to you, right? Those are what it does. It, I, don't, I don't know. I always thought it, it sounded weird. You're anchoring the document with an anchor tag. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, but nonetheless, it's the anchor tag. And href here, right? Does anyone know what that means? HTML reference. Yeah, HTTP, I think. Hypertext reference or something that like that. Uh, Ed? Hypertext. Hypertext reference, yeah. So, so what we're doing is we give it a link, right? We give the anchor tag a link, and then it's going to give us this here, Python books. So when we click on it, we can go somewhere. And by the way, this will all happen in the first week of free code camp if you persist with that curriculum. Okay, now, now here's the, there's another really big point here when you're parsing out a website. And that is uh, this ID attribute. So if we look here, this doesn't have one. But you could have said right up here, ID equals something or other. And here's the deal. The ID tag, you can only ever have one of them on a same page. So if you look at a page, you can find ID tags. You can go right to it. You don't have to know anything else. You don't have to know that this is an anchor tag. You don't have to know that it has a link. You don't have to know any of that stuff. Any tag with an ID is easy to do. You can go right to it. There's another one called class. We've heard of that. And classes are tend to be used much more for styling. And you can use that to group different tags up. So like, let's say that you go to a website and you see a bulleted list, right? Let's say the bulleted list has two tiers. You could make the top tier, you know, chapters and the bottom tier articles. Class equals chapter on each different bullet. Class equals article on the sub bullets, right? All right. So. Now, this is also really, really cool. Uh, I, I think it's going to be even more fun because I'm on OSX and nothing works on OSX, but we went through this earlier, I think in the last class, right? For those of you that are not on OSX, you will be holding Control-Shift-J. Does it say this stuff here? No, but it gives you the information for OSX, which is what I'm using, so we're good. Uh, no, you'll hold Control-Shift-J, and F12 should also work. It's going to open up a specific little console. And this console that it opens up, beautiful. OK, one second.
Yep, let's just make that bigger. Okay, this console that it opens up has a lot of stuff on it, right? Why is it the font so small? Okay, whatever. Just make everything else tiny. Okay, it has a lot of stuff here, right? This is, this is uh, uh, literally the coolest thing ever if you develop websites, right? Uh, it does everything you can imagine. And to be honest with you, like I develop websites for a living and I don't know everything this thing can do. It's that kind of powerful of a tool, right? It is excessively powerful. There's audits here. There's security features that'll like break down some things about security. Uh, some of these things I use sometimes and not other times. There's memory consumption. I use that. If you want to know why the hell a website's running slow or runs slower as you keep it running, you can use this feature to figure that out. Performance gives you other kinds of breakdowns. The network one is really cool and important. You'll use this one all the time. The sources one is also really cool and important because it allows you to see and modify code other people run. The console is a, essentially, we've all used Python 3 and idle and these types of things where we can run Python code. Well, the console on this thing allows you to run JavaScript code, right? So it looks slightly different. Console.log, hello world, and now you have a JavaScript hello world, right? So it's like everything we've seen for Python, built into one thing. It's inside of your browser. It runs HTML. It allows you to check out websites. So is this only for a particular browser or for any other? This is, so every browser now has a development tools and has something like development tools. The worst is the Microsoft one. Firefox one is reasonably decent. The best by a long shot, not even close, hit the ball out of the park, is the Chrome one. The Chrome one is the one every developer will use, including Microsoft developers, right? So it just shows you everything. It's, it's insane. Like I said, the, it's crazy powerful. But yes, here's what we want to look at, though, on this, right? We can see things like this guy up here at the top, div class. We can see the HTML with this, right? So if we go down on here, we can see all of the different articles that are on that page, right? We can see here that this is that tree structure that we've got. We can see his buy on Amazon link. We can see his Al Swigert link. All of this type of things we can see. And when you get really good with it, you can actually query the document live, right? Like I could say something like, let's see here. See how we have this ID equals post 125. We just covered ID. We could do something like document, right? Dot get element by ID. And then I could literally say right here, uh, where was that thing? Post one, two, five. And I had that post, right? So this is a good area where you can play with HTML when you start to learn it and you can help figure out what you need to do for Python. Does that make sense? Anyone have any questions on it? We're going to cover more of it with the book. I just wanted to show you like a little brief overview of what all this tool set does. Okay, so we have now opened up our browser's developer tools. Now you will notice here, because I have mine still open, even though you can't see it, because it's behind my shit, I have it still open. You'll notice that when I move over things, things turn different colors, right? We all see in this? See how the colors happen and things are beautiful and weird and funky? Okay, you'll see here that when I hold it over something like the image, it actually tells me your img.calibre8, right? What does that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. It means that there's this image is being brought to you by an image tag, right? And that image tag is part of a class called calibre8. And the reason why you want to know how to do all of this stuff is because when you write these little applications to crawl your websites, you may want to pull down this image. And to pull down this image, make a tool to do it, you're going to use the image tags. You already know the class, Calibre 8, right? So then you do that to get to the image tag, and all you want to do is look at that ref that we saw earlier. So we saw this guy up here, like this, ref equals. An image is just like that. The only difference is, rather than ref, it says source. So you say, I'm looking for all image tags with this class tag and I want to get the source of that. And then you'd actually have the URL for that image. Okay. 
So uh, if you notice here, it also switches up a little bit. It tells you a little bit about, this is like a, the feature. It'll tell you right here, this is how it's rendered. This is the rendering size of that text, right? 700 pixels wide by 115 pixels tall. Of course, that is not at all true when you're scaling on a 60 inch monitor, but yeah. And then uh, the color, black, the font, you know, it tells you all of that kind of stuff. If you ever want to jack someone's font and you want to know what they're using, oh, that's a pretty typeface. There's your method of doing it. Okay. And what they're doing now is let's get rid of that. So now we're going to use the developer tools to find elements, right? So what we're doing here is I don't know. So this is this book was written for weather.gov. Let's see if we can still do it. We open up weather.gov. Usually if you use a government site, they never change. So the author probably just figured it was safe to assume that it wouldn't change. Okay, so what we're doing here is we open up weather.gov. Before writing any code, do a little research. If you visit the site and search for a zip code, the site will take you to a page showing you the forecast area. So let's do that. So we're gonna type in our zip code here, 77007. We hit enter and we see this, Houston, Texas. I'm gonna click it. And it takes me here to this address up at the top. What's interesting is it has nothing at all in there with the 770. So this is a government site that I think changed. Dun, dun. Yeah. Nope. Okay. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to just simply save this URL, right? Because we can't, it, it, well, essentially we have two things. We have a zip code that we have given it right but the url doesn't work with zip codes the url is working with latitude and longitude coordinates so after we give it that zip code we can just copy this url right and we're going to use this url to scrape so the whole name of the game is to figure out what the 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 temperature is so after i land on this page right if i want to figure out what the temperature is right here i can click it and i can go down to inspect right now when I inspect it when we inspect it it should take me right to it right here see how it says 79 degrees Fahrenheit right here so in order to get to this what I do is I could look down for this current condition summary and then I could look for this thing class equals my forecast current large right or I could just go right for it I could say, how many things on here do we have that meet this? My forecast current condition large, right? And if I have that, if I have those abilities, either this guy here or this guy and this guy, I can get to the 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So I can make a program that figures out what the temperature is in my zip code anytime. So let's go back to it. And you can see here what he's doing. So we've we figured out where it was, right? In the developer tools, you can see that the, so it has changed, because here it is, my forecast current large. Is that what it was for us too, or was it something else large? I don't think it was my forecast large. Let's see here. Yes, it is, my forecast current large. So it, again, it hasn't changed. So parsing HTML, beautiful soup, right? And this is the mar module that's gonna allow us to get to it directly. So what are we going to do? First, we have to install Beautiful Soup. And then after we install Beautiful Soup, we can take a website like this and figure out how to get to stuff inside of it. So let's see here. I will install it. Quit. Pip install Beautiful Soup. Does it need a version? BS4. Ah, BS4. Is that what they're, the module is called? Okay. Like that? The book says pip install beautiful soup 4. BS4. Beautiful soup 4. Oh, beautiful soup 4. That's what the Okay. There we go. Okay, and we have it. <coughs> 
Okay. <clears throat> so now let's go through it. We're going to take it and we're going to do exactly what he's doing right here. We're going to run it right in the console. So I'm going to get out of this. I'm going to close this guy here. We'll close this guy up here. We're back down where we were before. And I'm going to go Python 3. We're going to import requests and BS4. Now we're going to say res equals request.get. Now if I look at that response, you can see here that the response is of type 200. And we've already figured out that we can do res.codes. I think it was res.codes. There it is, rest.status code. And I can get that 200 back out, right? So now what I want to do is I do rest, raise for status, and we're going to see that that does nothing. And the reason why it does nothing is because the code was 200. Now what I want to do is that he has, where he's actually using beautiful soup, right? So if I take this, we can say here, Now if I look at the no starch thing, where we do type, you can see here that we have this new beautiful soup thing. And the important point here is that this is not a string, right? This is a specific object that has all of the beautiful soup stuff already done to it. So now how do we use it, right? We can take here, we can say we, well, let's, let's actually try something here with it. We can say here, help, right? No starch soup. And we can see exactly the things we can do with it. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Now the book doesn't do anything with it, right? It essentially gets rid of it at this point. But if we look at this, we can see different things that we can do regarding how we're gonna actually get stuff from it. So we have text which says, get all child strings concatenated using the given separator. Let's use that just because we're playing around, right? So if I queue out of this, I'm going to call no starch soup dot text, just like that. No starch soup dot text, and you can see here all of this text, right, that we have. You can see all of the new lines here, right? This is all of the text that he has on his website. Right? The difference is that it has all of the HTML removed. So if we come down, this is what we ran. We, we got the page http no starch.com. And then what we simply did is I said, I want to get all of the text from it. So let's go down here. And I'm going to show you this is the no starch site. Okay, so this is what the site looks like that we just got. But let me show you what it actually is to the computer. See this? This has all of your HTML stuff here, your JavaScript stuff here. See this? This is all of that HTML stuff we just looked at. Remember, these are the pref tags uh -huh. where we're linking to all of that. When we called dot text, it pulled all of the HTML out and it just gave us the text on the page. That's the difference between the markdown and the text version. The markdown has the actual instructions there on how to render it, right? Render this as a link. Render this as a list. Render this as a specific divider, right? A, 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 divi a division of the site. The text, all of it's gone. All you see is the text, right? Okay. So, so, so. Let's get back to it. Close that one. Close that one. Close that one. Close that one. Okay, so what else can we do with it? Well, here's one example, right? In this case, what we're doing is we're opening the example file.html. Remember before I talked about how when you work with websites, your tasks of, of do working with the web breaks down into two things? One of them, we said, was requests, getting the data to you, the transit part. The other part is parsing the HTML. Well, what if you have the HTML file on your computer? That's a really weird internet, 
right? But you can do it. You can save the HTML for later or whatever, and you can have a website locally, right? So if you write an HTML site and you don't give it to something like cPanel or host it on a different website, you, you know, upload it to a WordPress, you can have it local on your computer, you can still open it up and you can still process that website with beautiful soup, right? So open takes the file, beautiful soup can take a file handle, or what you can do is you can call right here, beautiful soup with the text, it's the same thing. Give it response.text or give it the file handle, file object, okay? Either way, you're gonna get back this beautiful soup object and you can do the same things with it. Can you show it to us again? Can I show it? The one, the file that doesn't have the markup stuff in it. The file that, you mean the, the code that we ran? Yeah, well, well, the one, the thing that got produced when you took out the HTML markup and you were left with what was left. Yeah, this? That's right, because there's all kinds of stuff there. Yep, but there's no HTML. I see, so what, what is this level of? No, because the text representation has no HTML. We're, see, there's no tags in here. So I think so what were those text A0 at the Yeah, okay, so let's cover that. Okay, uh, by the way, I'm only gonna spend a little bit of time on this because it's totally not relevant to what we're doing. But what, what I, are you talking about this right here, the XA0? Uh, just stuff, whatever is there. Okay, what are we looking at? You're looking at the whole entire website with no format. Right, why don't, why don't you do this? Go to nostarch.com mm -hmm. on your page, and what we're gonna do is we can look at the very top word on it, right? <laughs> Here, I'll show you what we're looking at. If I can get to the top. Okay. Do, do, do. And I'm having you two fingers scroll, which I'm really dumb at. So you see here how we have no starch press right here, mm -hmm. the finest in geek entertainment? Mm -hmm. Remember that, the finest in geek entertainment. I'm gonna come back to the website, right? And I'm going to pop this up right here and we're gonna go back to no starch. Right, so now I'm at the no starch site and I'm gonna view the page source and we're gonna look here, the finest in geek entertainment. Do you see this? No. Okay, so this is, is the HTML element, title mm -hmm. and title. What I call the text method, the only thing you saw was what was inside. Right, but, but what about, but what's that other stuff that, that I've seen when I look outside? It's really good for me. You mean this stuff here? Well, yeah, all the stuff that isn't words. Different parts of words, the different words on the document. The ends? The new lines? The new lines? The new lines are just enters. So what this is going to do is it's going to convert all of the BR tags and all of the things that look like spaces to new lines. Okay, that's what I'm talking about here. So it's, it's, it's not... This is white space, but Python is rendering the white space like this. Let me show you something else here. That's a good point. Why don't we just print it out, and then we don't have to worry about that, right? So here, I have no starch.txt. If I enter it, we see the new lines, right? But if I print it, dun, dun, dun. now we actually print out the lines, right? So now look at it. Now that's what it actually looks like without the... So now it looks a lot less crappy, right? There's two kinds of formatting. Levels of formatting. The well, HTML one and the whatever this is. The text. It's that's right. You have HTML markup and <coughs> Python markup. That's that's kind of true, right? So here we go. This is the end of the first one, right? I think. No, it's not. There's a lot of shit here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me tell you. Let me tell you some of the other stuff. You do see some code in here, right? We can go through that. This is obviously code, right? So you may say, well, why is code in there if we set text? And I'm gonna show you the reason for it, right? Just so we can demystify some of this. You see this tag right here? Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a misfeature, in my opinion, about HTML. We all live with it, because fixing it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So the, there's, this is a script tag, right? The <coughs> script tag contains code. Mm -hmm. That's the way HTML is written. So when you tell, you tell the program you wanna get all of the text, Right? This is all text. This doesn't mean anything special to the computer unless you have the script tag. The script tag tells the computer this is code. So when we say text, it dumps all the text out, and the computer doesn't get in the business of figuring out whether or not it's code for a different language. 
This is not HTML code, this is JavaScript code. Right? Okay. Does that clarify it? Okay, cool. All right, all right. So, yes? In your personal opinion, do you think they should they handle the script tag properly? Then they just wiped it out? They handled, no, I think the idea that you put script with markup is a horrible idea. Not the HTML part, the, the no start. The uh, rendering of a script tag should just be blank. Yeah, I don't think it should be there at all. I don't think script tags should exist in HTML text. I mean, in the HTML spec, I think that they should all be external, and then you don't have that problem. But yeah, I mean, the reality is that not many people use them internally, or they shouldn't, except for no starch. So whatever. Okay. So uh, here's some of the examples of how we do things, right? We told you that with, with beautiful soup, we have a different abilities to get to different parts of the text that we don't have with regular text. That's why markup is fundamentally different from the Romeo and Juliet shit we were looking at earlier. What's up? So HTML is markup, right? Mm -hmm. And not all text is marked up. Like you, we have in the book, there's an example of Romeo and Juliet, and it's literally just the play with enters and all that, right? So when we look at this kind of stuff, we have soup.select and soup.select and soup.select and soup, all these types of things. These are all different methods to query a part of that document. Because the document is marked up, we can do sophisticated operations to figure out where everything is that we want. And some of those operations include selecting all div tags. This one here says select where the ID is equal to author. This one says select where the class equals notice. This one says select all span tags that are underneath div tags. Right? It's sucks. Fine, inside. <laughs> Anywhere inside, that's why. Okay. This one here says select all span tags that are one element inside. You know? Okay. So that's the kind of stuff we cannot do with text that we can do now with HTML. And you can see here when you start to see stuff like this, right? Soup.select, these are much more new. They're now widely supported. Right, but these get very complex. These are CSS attribute selectors here, is what they call these. So you can go down a deep rabbit hole about learning about CSS selectors. Okay. So what we're doing here is we import BS4, we say example file equals open, and we open up that HTML file we have saved on our computer. We're, now keep in mind this is going to return a file object. Now what we do is we say BS4.beautifulsoup and we give it the file object dot read, right? Now what does that do? Well, dot read is gonna return the whole thing as text, so we give, that. thank you, OSX, jeez. BS4.beautifulsoup, it's gonna take this as text, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna return a new thing, the example soup object, which represents the, what we just made with beautiful soup. So we have an example file object, which is the file, we have an example soup object, which represents the document marked up, right? Now what we're going to do is we say example soup dot select, and we give it ID equals author, right? Now you may say, how do I give it ID equals author? You give it ID equals author with this syntax right here. This looks weird to you because you've never seen it before, but for people like me, it's the same thing because I see it all the time. This is a CSS syntax, right? This is how you do things in HTML. This is essentially the ID symbol, right? So if you have a, the, the number sign, that means the ID. There's one of them. The period means class. That means there's zero or more of them, right? So type equals elements. I mean, uh, we, we pass the typed elements, and we can see we have a list. So this guy here always returns a list, right? How many things are in that list? Well, we know because it's an ID, and I said an ID is at most one, that we can either have one or zero things in that list. We have one, right? What kind of thing is that thing in the list? We have one of something in that list, what is it? It's a BS4 element.tag, right? Now this has its own methods. 
We talked about the tree before, how you can go into the tree, you can go right to the left of the tree, all that kind of crap. All of those methods are on this, bs4element.tag. You can figure out more of it with help. lm0.getText, right? This is essentially what we just did, which was interesting, right? We said we wanted to get the text of the tag, and it literally pulled out just the stuff on the inside. On the script tag, the inside of it is JavaScript program. And we saw that in the code. But in this tag, right, the contents here is this Al Swigert. Now, if I take this Al Swigert and I copy it and I search for it in the document, right, you're going to see it. This is where he's getting it from, right here. So there's this, this code. This is a paragraph tag. We have a span tag where an ID equals author. And then we have Al Swigert. And that's what we're trying to get. So if we call the document.query and we say id equals author dot text because we want to get the text of it we're just going to get al squeaker and that's how we start to query html pages okay let's go around and find all of because there's a lot of matches of al squeaker i should have went up instead of down there we go this is the original page we're querying by the way just so we can all take a look at that all right so this is his web page that we're querying and what we're trying to do is get the author. So in order to get the author, we look for ID equals author, and then we get a span tag. And if we call text on the span tag, we get just the thing inside of it. Does that make sense? If I'm throwing it over your head, you gotta say something. We'll clarify it. Okay. So there, here we are doing it here. You'll notice that when we pull the string on the whole element, we get the whole entire tag, right? We get all of it. And it, only if we call dot text on this or get text, right? If we call get text on, on the element zero, we get Al Swigger. But if you want to just see what the whole thing equals, it's really the whole tag. So if all of this stuff wasn't here, the span tag wasn't here, and we just had Al Swigger, then element zero would just return this, right? It would just return the else weaker part. But because it's got a tag, we have to call it get text. I'm trying to show you the difference between some of these things in this list can just be text. Some of them are going to be markdown, more markdown. If it's more markdown, you have to query the text. You query that text, this thing inside the element, by using get text. So it requires you to know your document. Okay. This code will pull the element with id equals author out of our HTML. Yeah, we just saw that. You can pull all of the p elements out from the beautiful soup object by doing this. Here he selects p, right? Now notice when we select something like p, right? You see this little p here? Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're selecting the p tag, which means paragraph. So that's not just any letter. He's saying select all tags that are p, which is the paragraph tag. Now, we can have zero or more of them, right, can be in that list. We could, have a t we could have a document with no P tags. We could have a document with a million. When we get them, we can select the first one just by indexing it like it was an array. So the first P tag is right here. You can see that's what it returns. It includes all of the, the tag and all of the content underneath it, from the starting tag to the ending tag. By the way, for those of you that don't know HTML at all, this thing right here, you'll see this. See this guy right here? This is telling you that that tag is an ending tag. So you have this tag without it is the starting tag. This tag with it is the ending tag. So when you say get keys, it's going to return to you the whole entire tag with all of the contents of it, from the starting tag until the ending tag. That's how HTML works. Now, if we call get text on that P, what do we get? We're going to get only the text. This is how exactly the text function works. Download my. We're not going to get the tag name. We're going to get Python. We're not going to get the closing tag. We're going to get book from. We're not going to get anything in the anchor tag. We're going to get the words here, my website. This is the text. The rest of it is the markup dot get text gets you the text and it leaves the markup aside
Okay. The second element works the same way. Right, this is where he does the, the Al Swigert stuff. Getting data from an element's attributes. So, so far, you'll notice all of the data that we've queried was on the inside, right? See Al Swigert? Al Swigert is between the starting tag for span and the ending tag for span. But it's not the only place you'll find data. What if you wanted to get right here, the slogan? Right, that is also data. It's part of the markup data, but it's still data. And you can get it, right? All you do to do that is use the get method. So you can call span element dot get ID and you'll find the, the, that tags ID. You see here we have span ID equals author. If I find the tag and I want to get the ID, I can say get ID, I get author. If I want to get the text, I say get text and I get Al Swigert. Span element dot get some non-existent ad, ad, address. Now we said that before. I said in each one of these things, we're returning zero or more, zero or one. ID is zero or one. You're either going to get one ID or none. Class is zero or more. You may get no nothing with that class. You may get a million things with that class. We say span dot get some non-existent attribute, and it says equals none, and that's true. So what would it be to get this to say not equals to true? Right? Here's how you would do it. You see how we have span element? The span element is defined right here. If I was to take it, right, let me open up my console. So you can see this here. And what we're going to do is, of course, OSX, you are the enemy. Okay. We can take it and I can say here, I want to copy that. Okay, right there. So we have, this, we have this HTML tag right here. If I wanted to add another attribute to it, I could do this, right? This is what it's looking for. When it said my non-existent attribute, <laughs> okay. So when it was testing that attribute that didn't exist, this is what that attribute would look like. You can have anything you want here as an attribute. Can we all see this? It's a little bit shrinky and small, but let me see here if I make it a little bit bigger. This here is the attribute. ID is an attribute, and this was the one that it was looking for, my non-existent attribute, right? So if I go back to it, right here, You'll see that's exactly what they're doing. They're asking you to get some non-existent attribute, right? They just, it just so happens to be that this, some non-existent attribute does not exist on the span tag. So what does it do? It returns none. None equals none, so then you get true. Span elements that attributes, you can see right here, we say ID equals author, and what happens? It returns ID equals author. What is this? ID equals author is a dictionary of all of the attributes, right? of the span element. So if you look here, we have this element here, and it has in it ID author, right? This is represented in a dictionary like this. This is pretty cool. When you want to query HTML with Python, the query the attributes with Python, you can use this method here, this property attributes, and it returns them all as a dictionary. So if you want to say something, like let's say you have a tag and it has 10 different attributes on it, and you want to write a program that iterates through all of them, how would you do it? Here's one method you can use, span element.attributes. After you have this, you have a dictionary. What do you do to get all of the things in a dictionary right here? Keys, right? So you would do span elements.attributes.keys, and you would get a list of all of the keys from that attribute. That's exactly right. Okay. Now we're going to do it. I'm feeling lucky Google search. Does anyone here know what I'm feeling lucky is? I always wonder who uses that feature, but some people do. I remember it. I haven't used it before. 
geeks know the feature. I've always wanted to know someone who actually uses the feature. I think they got rid of it. I think it's still there. Right there. I'm feeling lucky. Okay, I'm feeling lucky is a stupid feature where you blindly trust an AI of infinite uh, uh, intellect to give you what it thinks you want. So essentially, when Google implemented this feature, it was almost a joke. And the joke was that our search engines are so accurate that you don't no longer even have to see our results. We're just going to send you to the first one. So there are actually some Facebook, a lot of that we just have Facebook, even if you do the normal search, you just take it Facebook. So I'm told. I haven't actually tried that. That's terrifying. So if you do Facebook. I'm feeling lucky you got pushed into the normal search for some reason. So if I do Facebook here, it'll send me to Facebook? Like this, like if I do Facebook Evan Carroll, it's going to take me to my Facebook page. No, no, like, just just like, just like Facebook or Facebook.com or something. Oh, well, that's the site that you can make your searches. No, it's, that's kind of you mean like you that, Facebook.com? Yeah, remove your name. Remove my name, and it's going to send me right to Facebook. Yes, it does. Yeah, for me. Well, you have to enter the first one. You got to click on feeling lucky. Yeah, yeah, you got to, you mean if I click on feeling lucky. So if you type in Facebook right there. Right here. And then once you type it in, click, I'm feeling lucky. Well, yeah, but if you click, I'm feeling lucky, you go there no matter what, right? So I, don't know. I think that's what you're saying. Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying it's not that I'm feeling lucky, but it's still. Okay. Now I get to Maybe we, we should hit that one up after class. I'm, I'm interested in what you have to say there. I'm not sure I'm following that. But uh, so here's what we have the I'm feeling lucky feature works like this. You give it whatever the hell you're looking for. Like, let's say you want bicycles in China, right? Now, I have no idea what bicycles in China will bring up as the first result. But if I want to choose it blindly, I can just say bicycles in China, right? And then say, I'm feeling lucky. And it's going to find me some page about I'm feeling uh, bicycles in China, not presenting me the search results, right? Now, this is usually porn. So let's just... <laughs> no. <laughs> Not this time. We got lucky. That's my opinion on I'm feeling lucky. I'm feeling lucky is like, well, the internet's a pretty fucking horrible place, and I don't ever feel lucky enough to trust that button, unless I'm live streaming. The bike over share, the bike share search oversupply on? in China. What's up? Do you have safe search on? Do I have what? Safe search on? I don't think so. Might, you might take it apart. Oh, well, we'll save that for the next class. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> So, so here's, here, it took us right here, right? So we could create a, uh, a search thing, right, that didn't rely on Google search results, but it relied on their ability to, uh, to live dangerously with the I'm feeling lucky button. So what we're doing here is we take the automate the boring stuff with Python, and we say, get search keywords from the command line arguments. Oh, oh, look at that. Look at that. The paperclip isn't even involved. The clipboard is not involved in this one. We're, we're achieving new levels. Get search keywords from the command line arguments, retrieves the search result page, opens a br browser tab for the result, right? So what the hell is the whole, I don't know what that has to do with I'm feeling lucky. Op opens a browser tab for the result. This code, this means your code will do the following. Read the command line from sys.argv, fetch the search results with the request module, find the links to each search result, Call the web browser, web browser .open function to open the web browser. Open a file, a new file window, and save it as lucky.py. Find the links to each search result. Okay. Ah. Okay. So the way this works is here. I'll tell you what. We should have read this a little bit better. This is. This, so I'm feeling lucky with Google. When you do it, you get one page opened, right? You type in something like bicycles in China, right? I come right down here, bicycles in China, and I hit enter. The very first thing at the top, right up here, is the bike share oversupply in China. If I hit the I'm feeling lucky button, that's where it takes me. It takes me to this, right? We're creating an application that finds the first page, and then it opens up everything on the page. So rather than just one result, we're opening up multiple results. Okay, so we have like, this is like the super I'm feeling lucky button. 
if you had a one, you know, you, every time you hit the, um, you go down one further. Yeah, we better make sure safe search is on. <laughs> I'm going to have a lot of surprises here. Get the search. Okay. So get the command line argument and request the search page. We have this, this program right here, import request sys web browsers BS4. Notice this is getting pretty long, right? As your code becomes more and more complex, you start to import more and more code you, other people wrote and not you. Uh, that's good. That shows that you're being lazy and other people are doing work that works. So we say print Googling. We say request.get. Notice we, don't, we just send the arguments here, right? We're going to take it. We say the space dot join and then all of the things from sys.argv that aren't the first one. A slice, the second throughout the end of the arguments, right? The first one is the name of the program, so we want to cut that off. So we're dropping off the first argument, putting the rest of them there. So we're going to go google.com forward slash search question mark Q and then a bunch of shit. Now for those of you that don't know, the search, dot, the search question mark Q equals, this is a very old thing on the web and this works for most sites, right, that have search, this will work for it. If I go here, google.com, forward slash search, question mark Q equals, and I type in right there, bicycles in China, it's going to do the same thing as if I typed in on the home page, right? So that's knowledge that you have to have before you start this project. If I hit enter here, it's the same page, right? So once more, let's go through this again. When we did it in the beginning and we came down here and we typed in bicycles in China, I want you to see this link up at the top, right? Because we covered this at the beginning of the class, right? This is the same thing as this. Question mark, no, search, question mark, Q equals bicycles in China. These two pages are the same, right? You'll notice how they look the same. Why is this URL so much longer? Tracking, cookies. Tracking, right? Tracking, cookies. This is where they put all the spyware, the tracking abilities in that. We talked about that with Facebook earlier. So all you need is this search question mark Q thing, and you can give it your terms. This one here is the normal one, and you can see here all of these different tracking elements that, that Google puts into it. So that's how Google knows that when you give this link to your grandma that you sent it to her. With love. With love. <laughs> yes? Another thing in there is the language override, though. Sometimes you do need to speak it. Come on, no one in America speaks two languages. I'm kidding. You. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, in theory, you could use that, and it could be useful. You know, you speak English and Turkish or some other language, you may want to come back later and have the same one. But yes, there, there's some other useful things there that aren't simply tracking, but mostly it's tracking. Okay. So find all the results. So here's what we do. We use beautiful we use beautiful soup to extract the top search results. So here's the research results. What we're going to do is we're going to try to find out, like this here, we want to extract it. We want to extract this. We want to extract this guy down here. We're trying to extract all those search results. And how do we do it? Well, you're going to see here, these are the links that they're creating for us. And we see URL equals, the, this is the URL link, right? And the reason why this URL link is so complex is because this is more tracking information. Right? But you can see here data.ref and you have the real URL. Right? So what we need to do is we need to pull out the real URL. So you can see how we do it. We first we load all of the search results into beautiful soup, and then we say the link elements equals soup.select, and we look for the search results that are the anchor tags. Right? Does this kind of make sense to everyone? Does everyone see what we're doing here? Did I lose anyone on this? Okay. So we say soup.select, and we're looking for all the results and all the anchor tags. And now we're going to open up, right, the minimum between five and the length of the link elements. What is this going to do? What if Google returns one thing? If Google returns one thing, we don't want to try to open five. We all want to only open one. So we look for the minimum between five and the length of whatever, however many links we have, right? Then we say 4i in the range, so 4i in, five or four, or three, two, one, web browser dot open, 
and then we open it, right? So that's what's happening. So let me show you something else here just so we can see this implementation. When we look at these links, we you come down here to the, the either one of them, right? And we look at this link right here. I get to click it and I'm going to go inspect, right? Now I have this, my, my inspector opens up. I'm going to full screen it. You can see this thing right here. You see how it's all this crap here? Well, we have this one, which is plain text. And I think one of my add-ons is doing this. But we have all of this stuff here down below, right? This is what you feed to Google normally. So we take this and we're going to be copying this here. Just like that, we have all of that stuff copied at the top, and I hit enter, and of course it craps out. The previous page is sending you to blank. Ah, okay. That's just it warning me where we're gonna go. And that's where it's taking me. So this is how the crawler works, is it takes this link here that we have, and we add it to the Google thing, and then we get this. So that's why we're doing this right here You'll see this, we're doing webbrowser.open and we're putting the link elements, the ref element at the end of the Google thing. And the reason is because Google has a path for every different page on the internet that they generate. And they use that instead of the actual link. And the reason is because they want to track you, right? So when you have a link in Google, it doesn't take you to link to another website. It takes you a link to their own website. Why? Because if it took you to another website, they wouldn't know that you clicked on it. If it takes you to their website first, they know you clicked on it. That's why all of the links inside of Google are tracked. So here we're using webbrowser.open and we're saying Google. And the reason why we're doing that is because they have those tracking links. Yes? Does it, does it change the referrer also by doing it that way? Uh, no, it, the referrer is from Google. So you remember that stupid nag screen I just got one second ago? This one, this is because when I pasted this in there, the referrer wasn't set. So Google gives me this screen. But if the referrer was Google, it would take you right to it. Catch me after the class. Yeah. He's asking very geeky questions, and we'll geek out about that, and I'll tell him how that works. Okay. Ideas for similar programs. By the way, I, yes, I had crawled Google professionally and for money. It's beating their system is definitely very profitable. Okay. The benefit of tab browsing is that you can easily open links and new tabs to pursue later. A program that automatically opens several links at once can be a nice shortcut to do the following. Open all the product pages after searching a shopping site such as Amazon. Open all the links to reviews for a single product. Open all the results of links to photos after performing a search on them. And I like this because this is actually extremely practical. Does anyone here know what XKCD is? Okay, that's good. These are the better parts of the group. XKCD. <laughs> XKCD is easily one of the best sites online. So today they found the new picture of the black hole, right? Everyone catch that news? Yeah. For the first time in human history, we actually took a picture of a black hole and the internet literally shit a brick. It was amazing. So here's what they have here. The size comparison, the M87 black hole in our solar system. It's always like geek humor or something amazing or something crazy. So there's Pluto, there's the sun, there's Voyager uh, at the end of the solar system and then the, literally the black hole is that thing. So, uh, and what does it say? Is there like a, a holdover on this yeah, one? Yeah, there's a holdover. I think Voyager 1 would be just past the event horizon, but slightly less than halfway to the bright ring. Okay, cool. Hilarious. That's actually not funny at all. But a lot of them are. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, but but I, give them, I give them leeway because if you're a geek, you're way into this black hole shit. It's been all over the place. So let's hit, let's hit the previous button. Here you go. How was the party? Uh, talking, blah, blah, blah. I talked so much, too much, probably my face is tired. So many conversations, I'm worried that all my opinions were bad. Why did I talk so much? Time to hide under my bed and never speak to another human again. He hides underneath his bed. Five minutes later, I have some new opinions. That didn't take long. Okay, that's definitely the talking of geek, right? So all, all of these like comics are very geeky. And what we're doing is we're gonna create something that crawls them, right? And what it does is it loads the XKCD homepage saves the comic image on that page, 
follows the previous comic leap, repeats until it reaches the first comic. Now the XKCD CD comic has been out for at least 10 years. So yeah, there's 2,133 of them. So essentially what we're gonna do is download all of the XKCD comics with our program. This is gonna be the most useful piece of software in the world. What's up? We should all do this simultaneously. <laughs> That's, yeah, we should definitely do that. No. I think if we ever did actually crash XKCD, you'd have all of Reddit that would come kill us. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's what we're creating. We're gonna create a montage of XKCD comics. So, uh, and we only have 30 minutes, so we'll get through half of this. By the way, this is more how the book is gonna continue. Remember, we, I had that conversation earlier. We're getting away from computer science. We're getting more to practical shit. Practical shit takes more time. So uh, that's the way that that's happening when I have to explain all this stuff. Figure 11, the dash six XKCD, a webcomic of romance, sarcasm, math, and language. There we go. This means your code will lead you to the following. Uh, didn't we just do that? We just did that. Uh, design the program. The URL of the comics image file is given by the href attribute. This is the hypertext reference attribute of an image element. Uh, yeah, I don't know that, 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 I think it's actually image source, not image ref. But okay, the image element is inside of the div ID comic element. Let's take a look at that. We click on this, we click inspect, and we can see it right here. This is the image tag, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm right and he's wrong. That's what happens in do all the time. The image tag is right here. This is where the image is located. Is that we read the HTML. Image source equals this, right there, right? What are they exciting about? Well, it's not the, um, the alt text or anything, it's just... Yeah, the tile thing. It's okay, it seems we were accidentally zoomed in slightly too far, but imagine there's a cool looking twisted accretion disk just outside this black square. That is pretty cool. I like that. Five years later. <laughs> EHT black hole picture. Cool. Yeah. So the point is we need to find this image tag and we need to capture the source element because if we have the source element and we know the website, which is xkcd.com, images.xkcd.com, right, then we can actually get to that image. And then when I click it, let's take it here. Whoops. No. Copy it. I'm going to quit out of this thing. Come over here. Paste it right here. Now you'll notice that this is the two forward slashes, which means we have to add the HTTPS. And then there we go. That's, is that another black hole comment? We linked up our observatories, but uh, yeah, it's another one. We linked up our observatories, got everyone aligned, and there it is, the first image of a black hole. Can you share that picture? Well, here's the thing. Turns out the telescope feed is like Pinterest, where you can't right click to save an image. <laughs> so we tried to take a screenshot, but the key combination kept turning off the display instead. I grabbed my phone and tried to take a picture of the screen, but I was too slow. The observation had ended. We're planning to try again next year, and we'll definitely record the screen this time. <laughs> There you go. So what we do is we, we get the image element, right? And then we're gonna hit the source of the image, not the href, and then that's gonna give us the address. And then we download the image and we hit the previous button, do it again. So here's what the code looks like. We start off and this is the boilerplate. I actually like this feature a lot about the book because people get overwhelmed when it comes to creating a program. And like I said, this is a valid way to do it. URL HTTP XKCD os.makedir. So we're creating a directory called XKCD. Exist equals, uh, exist okay equals true. So if it already exists, don't worry about it. It won't fail, that's a feature. While not, URL that ends with pound, right? So what does that mean? That means that uh, what we're doing here is the URL is XKCD. Something is gonna change the URL. And so long as that URL doesn't end with pound, it's good, right? So if I look here, it doesn't end in pound. We're good, we're ready to move on to the next one. Previous, doesn't end in pound, it's good. Previous, doesn't end in pound, it's good. So that's how that works. Download the page, find the URL of the comic image, download the image, save the image to XKCD, get the previous URL. What we're gonna store it is URL, and then it's just simply tested. 
Okay. You'll have a variable URL that starts with the value xkcd and repeatedly update into for loop. We quit if it ever equals the pound. You will download uh, the image files to a folder in the current directory named xkcd. Blah, blah, blah. Here we implement a little bit more. Now we actually say downloading the page. Remember this is a string and here's our URL. So we're going to actually tell you the URL we're downloading. We say res equals request.get, right? We're actually going to get the, the URL. So what is this? What is this? R E S. It's the response object, right? That we're we're getting back. Now what we're doing is we're saying re raise for status. Is it 200? If so, keep going on. If we get to this line, it's 200. Now we have soup. What is soup? Soup object represents the HTML. It's the soup object, right? So now we don't just have a bunch of shit we got from a server that's bytes. We have actual HTML. We can we can navigate. Right? Then we find the URL of the comic image, we download the image, and we save the image XKCD. Moving on. Next piece of code. We're definitely going to get through this in time, I hope. Uh, so here's what we do. Notice we're snipping. All that stuff above us is still valid, but we're moving down. Now we're looking for the comic element. How do we find it? We look for ID equals comic, right? And then what we're doing is we're looking for the next image tag that's inside it, as Robert would say. So we come down here. I click it. By what is this one? Emoji dome. <laughs> Thank you to XKCD April first volunteer commentators. I guess that's April first. I don't get that one. It went over my head. I'm not smart enough. Someone will have to explain it to me later. Maybe. Let's go to the next one so I can feel smart too. Nickname for industries. Nope. I can't use it there. Nickname for industries and organizations ranked by how silly it sounds. When you say someone is in the pocket of, and then as we go to the right, it gets sillier. Cigarette companies and big tobacco, that's usually true. Drug companies and big pharma, usually true. The farming industry is big ag, eh, usually true too. Automakers, big car, uh, that's a little bit weirder. The International Aquarian Foundation's big horse. Yeah, that one is a little far-fetched. The Board of P Pediatric Medicine's big foot. The mining industry's big hole. And the American Egg Board's big egg. Right, as you go to the right, it just, okay. So what we're gonna do here is we inspect it. Now, remember what we're looking for, comic and then image, right? So here's the ID equals comic and here's the image. So now we see it, see ID equals comic, see image. Okay, it's going away. I go here, I pop back here. That's what we do. We're looking for that right here. Right here, comic image. Now we say, if we get back an empty list, we print this out. Could not find a comic image. Now there's another way to do this. We could have said comic elm dot length equals zero, right? Or length of comic elm equals zero. But we just compared against an empty list. Could not find the comic image. Try. Okay? If we have a try and a catch, a try and accept right here, what does that mean? It means something in here can die, can throw an exception, right? Can cause us problems. What does that? This guy right here. This guy's gonna raise an exception. So that's why we put the whole thing in a try catch block. So we try to get the comic URL, right? And then if we do get the comic URL, we're good. If we have a problem, what do we do? We skip this comic and we go to the next one. So let's say we're, well, we start at this one. We start at like, let's say uh, 4,000 or whatever. Then we try 3,999, 998, 997, 995, whatever. And then it dies. That comic isn't working, right? It's not there, something's not working. What do you do? This is what we're doing. We're skipping it and we're going to the next one. So for that, we just look for the previous link and we go back, we start. We set, reset the URL to the new link, the previous link, and we continue back up at the top, right? So that's what we're doing. If the, the image isn't there, move on. Okay. See, a few XKCD images have special content that isn't a simple image. Right? I don't know where they're at. That'd be another project, figure it out. Save the image and find the previous comic. Right? So here's what we do. Same thing we did before. Image file. We open a file that doesn't exist because we're going to make it and write to it. And then we use this for chunk in res.iter content. We do image file dot write chunk and then we close it. And just to be clear, this is bytes. We're working with a file the same way we would work with the text. 
right? Doesn't matter because the, when we iterate with the content, we're getting back bytes and we can treat anything like bytes. You can only treat text like text. You can, treat, you can only treat text as text, right? So if you say that something is text, it has to be text. But you can treat either text or bytes as bytes. Okay, previously, soup.select. We get the previous link and we reset it now. Right, and then done. And here's what it looks like. Now this looks a lot like the last crawler we saw for the, uh, the Google Plus stuff, right? Download page, download image. Download page, download image. Download page, download image. So on and so forth. And then we have three different ideas for similar programs, right? I don't think we're going to have the time here to do any more ideas for similar programs. And we have 15 minutes anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this program working. Uh, we're going to take one more look at it, and then we're going we're gonna to be done. So this one is called right here, right? Download xkcd.py. And we already talked about that. This is all available right here. Downloads. Automate the boring, automate online materials, right? LS, and it's called download xkcd.py. Python 3, download xkcd.py. Oops. User warning, no parser was explicitly specified. So I'm using the best available HTML parser for the system, HTML parser. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know where that's tied. Invalid URL. Okay, okay, here. So here's the problem right here. I'm going to show it to you. Line 24. Comic URL. Oh, oh, I bet it's the HTTPS thing. Let's try this. So the whole entire web has moved away from HTTP, and now sometimes they just error when you try to do it. No, still getting there. No parser was explicitly specified, so I'm using the best parser. Features equals ah. So this is what it's requiring. But then why did it still error? What if the parser is automatically adding another HTTPS colon colon? Let's see here. Nope, I don't get the top error now. I'm just getting the bottom error. So invalid URL, images, XK, let's... See, I, see, I, see, I see an extra double orange. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Where? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where? You mean this double colon? <laughs> I think that this is the issue, is that one of these URLs is getting chopped up.
Let's try getting rid of this. Nope. Oh, wait. No, he's doing it right here, right? So he's fixed this. In the text, it was wrong. It said heref, but in the code, he's right. It says source. Uh, let's try if we just delete this, what it does. Now it's not going to download. No? So the, the source doesn't have a schema in it. Because it's the tabs. We both have it. But where's the one that's calling that, right? So you're talking about the comic, oh, the comic URL. Okay, here. This is the problem right here. Let's try this. HTTPS, there we go, plus comic URL. I forgot that there's a comic URL. Okay. Nope. Now we have, now it says no host applied. You have a bunch of yeah, source packets. Yeah. yeah. So it's confused because it thinks the host should be further to the left. Take out the two slashes slash you just typed in. There we go. Okay. So, now here's the deal. If anyone wants to send that patch to the author, there's your first patch. Right? So now we have, we have an actual issue and we've live coded the solution. He's actually missing his schema. Do you see what we're doing? Let me give you a recap of the problem and where we encounter the problem, right? Okay. Come back here. You'll see what we do is we say right down here, comic.element.source, right? See how we're getting the source of the comic? Right. Watch this, because you guys get to see what we screwed up on and what took me a while to catch. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of the full screen thing. We're going to go back here, and I'm going to pull up an XKCD comic. If I look at this comic, right, and I hit inspect, now I'm, I'm in the HTML for it. What I want to do is I want to find this guy right here. You see this? This does not have a schema. It's not a valid link. The reason why they do that is because these two forward slashes you can start any link with, and if you're on HTTP, the link is on HTTP. If you're on HTTPS, the link is on HTTPS. So this doesn't say whether or not it's HTTP or HTTPS. If you're on the HTTPS site, you get the HTTPS link. If you're on the HTTP site, you get the HTTP link, right? It doesn't say. But the scraper we made needs to know. So you have to tell it you want the HTTP link or the HTTPS link. That little thing was the error. And actually, if I was looking at the error, not the stack trace, I would have seen it a lot earlier because it was actually pretty clear. If I come back here and I undo this, right, we go back to the beginning, and I write this, and I run it again, this was the original error. Right? No schema supplied. It's right there at the bottom. And that's what I should have seen that. And when I did see it, I went and I looked at the code and I said, let me try to fix that. And I saw this right here and I said, there is a schema there. Oh shit. Like if it's telling me there's no schema supplied and there is a schema, then what do I do? But what I didn't remember or I didn't see in the code is that what we're doing is we're getting the other link right here, this comic URL this comic URL doesn't have a schema. The URL at the top for the page does. So we download the page and then the page has an image in it. That image has a link too. That doesn't have the, the schema. The page does. We give it one. The image itself does not. So we have to add one. And all I had to do was come over here and say right here request.get HTTP like that, plus comic URL. And then it would have worked. All right, so I hope we turn this live coding fail into a live coding success, and now you have an understanding of the problem, and you can hopefully debug it a little bit better in the future. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is another problem, but we're going to pretend like that didn't happen and everything ran smoothly. <laughs> Okay, so here's the next problem, right? This the author also didn't tell you about. 
I'm going to go ahead and tell you this problem, and I'll tell you how you solve it. When you get down here to this one down here, right, we go down here to this uh, XKCD2067, right? I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to blow your mind. We copy it, right, and I'm going to paste, go, go over here, and I'm going to paste it right here. Now, on this one, we right-click and we go down to inspect. And then you look at it right here, and what do you see? Nope, we don't see it there either. No, but what's different about it? Come on, Marco, you're really attentive with details. I expect you to catch this one. Boom. Boom, right there. Say it again. There's only a single slash, right? So I said that double slashes was special because double slashes says whatever schema you're on, HTTP or HTTPS, make it work. This one, we only have a single slash. Single slash is not special. This is why crawling the web takes a lot of experience. It takes, you, you build up experience running into these problems, right? And you can solve them. So it's one of those types of things that you gotta like learn to look out for. You gotta know the meaning of a double slash. If, if, you, if you're crawling a whole slew of websites, some of the websites work fine, one of them shits out on you, you have to know how do you handle the website that shit out on you? How do you correct from it? Because you still want this data. So now you've got to look. Do you have one slash or two? If you have one slash, you may have to add another one. Right? You've got to take all that stuff into account if you want to download all of the XKCD archive. And it is very important and vital that we all do that. Okay. There we go. So, now we've explained two live coding fails. <laughs>